angeschlossen sind. Eins, 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 eins. Ja, schönen guten Tag. Können Sie mich verstehen? Hallo, hallo, hallo. Ja, ist Pegel da. Gut. Okay, am nächsten Mal ist die Frage, wie wir das mit Ihnen und Mikrofon machen. Okay, am nächsten Mal hätte ich das schon mit mir rumschleppen. Werden Sie dann mit dem Regen Handmikrofon zu tun? Bitte? Nee. Können Sie mit dem Handmikrofon? Also ein Ding haben Sie nicht, so zum Anklicken. Ähm, wir haben ein Headset, aber die sind hier nicht, glaube ich, gerade im Einsatz. Die sind gerade in einem Haus zum Beispiel. Also, also. Ich glaube, ich habe jetzt nur Hans Mikrofone hier. Anstecker machen wir sowieso nicht, weil sie wehen. Also. Das ist davon beim Sitzen. Und ähm, sonst haben wir die. Also jetzt die Frage: ähm, Handmikrofon oder die hier? Ja, das ist jetzt aber auch für mich für Exeter und ähm, Zagreb so. interessant. Also, da also. ist es auch, wenn Sie ein Handmikrofon nehmen, dann habe ich umso mehr zum Arbeiten. Bei dem ist es ja leise. Also man merkt das schon. Hier, ich, werde noch, ich kann auch nach oben gehen, aber. Sag mal, was ist denn besser für die Übertragung? Also Handmikrofon. 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 Ja. Ja. Weil wenn Sie richtig reinsprechen, sage ich mal, wenn Sie sich so ja. halten, ähm, dann habe ich einen Pegel, da kann ich hier bis zu 120 dB gehen. Aber ich also, und hier wackelt es dann immer auf und runter. Ja, ja, genau. Und Sie müssen wirklich laut und deutlich sprechen, weil ich habe bei dem, ähm, sag ich mal, nicht die Spielraum. Also, gut, ja. Das wird toll. Danke. Z, Z, eins, Z, eins, Z, Z, ja, schönen guten Tag, hallo, 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 ja, gut.
Test, 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 test. Test, test. Okay, das ist schon mal ein gutes Zeichen. Hallo? Okay. Da komme ich nicht so weit. Ja.
Ja. ja. Guten Tag in Berlin. Welcome Exeter, welcome Zagreb. We are now going to listen to the third lecture of this Dido Forum and I invite Robert Klein to start with his talk. Yes, thank you all for coming, for your interest in the presentation today and uh, thank you Erhard for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Um, I will uh, try to give you three ins little insights into what type of argument a mathematician could make that somehow contributes to climate research in, in the broader picture. I will not discuss climate research per se. I will rather try to work out the type of argument that mathematics would contribute. And um, I'll first say a little bit about uh, why do we have climate models, and here I mean computational climate models that run on supercomputers. Why are they so important and play such a crucial role in climate research? I will then say something about um, how these complicated models can be somehow simplified systematically and what one can say about their validity from a math point of view. Then I will say something about data and uh, about language. So the first are, uh, two slides are about <clears throat> the case for climate models. Why are computers so important in this context? Um, the um, World Meteorological Organization defines climate um, at different levels of computers you could say. They start out with saying weather is uh, what is happening to the atmosphere at any given time, very loosely speaking. Then 
Climate, in a narrow sense, is a statistical description of the weather in terms of mean and variable relevant period of time. So it is about the weather, and as you can see from these keywords, the mean and the variability or variance, it is about statistics of the weather. And um, then climate in a broader sense is the status of the climate system, which comprises the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, cryosphere, etc., etc., etc. So you can see up here we have been speaking about weather. That's happening, of course, in the atmosphere. Whereas the climate system, when you look at it at longer times, like 30 years, then the atmosphere, of course, communicates with the ocean, and you have to describe them together to see how the atmosphere evolves. And in fact, also the atmosphere communicates, say, with the land surface, because there's plants growing, and those have an effect on what happens in the atmosphere. Now, as you can see down here, a lot of components besides what happens in the atmosphere, namely the weather, play a role if you want to describe this in a large, um, in, in over long time scales. And um, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change has this picture in the sketch in their assessment report from 2007, which gives an indication of what are all the components that one should be looking at and take into, into account when trying to model climate over long time scales. Those are the atmosphere, then the atmosphere interacts, for example, with the sea ice, um, then there, it interacts with the ocean, then precipitation goes into the soil, the soil gets moist, you get evaporation back from the soil into the air, etc., etc. So it's, there's a huge complexity. Now, why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you this because that complex system we can fortunately not model in a laboratory experiment, which means we have no means of going into a detailed controllable system and, and to try and tweak it and understand its mechanisms and workings by experimenting on it. The only thing we can do is observe the Earth and try to put up many, many measurement stations and see what happens with the system as it evolves in time. Since laboratory experiments as physicists or engineers would have them are not possible with the climate system, we have to come up somehow with other means of looking into the details. And that's where computer models come in. So climate researchers build com complex computer models where they, as faithfully as possible, build in many of these mechanisms that you see sketched here. And then they run the computer models and look into the details of what happens in the computer model, hoping that that would give us more insight into what happens in the real climate system. Right? This is why computer models are so important. Now, obviously, just the sketch here, I don't even have to give you any formula. You can imagine that describing it at this level of, of complexity is, is, is overwhelming. And so we have a challenge of dealing with the um, modeling and simulation system that's very complicated, extract the statistics from it, because the climate was defined to have to do with the statistics of the weather. And then the questions are, how can we handle the huge amounts of data that come out, and how can we possibly maybe simplify the model a little without losing too much information? And that latter point I will discuss next, namely how can one start from a complex system and reduce it judiciously by much mathematical arguments uh, to make it more amenable to analysis. So here we go talk about model reduction and, and uh, a little bit rigorous analysis. I'm just going to give you a result rather than trying to explain the details to you. I want to explain that with a little example. Suppose we are looking at a large lake that is to fill a small reservoir with water, and we have a valve here that we have under our control. So we can open the valve slowly, or we can open the valve very rapidly. And depending on what is the speed with which we open the valve, the, 
the, the surface of the water in the small reservoir will evolve very differently. As we can see next, here is a sketch. Suppose we are in the fast filling mode. We just open the valve very rapidly. What then happens, as you can imagine, is that a wave of water will splash in the reservoir back and forth. And the red line is the, supposed to be the surface of the water level. And then the gray line, the horizontal line, is just the mean of it. Right? And what, you, what we can see here, we have opened the valve, the water sloshes around, and then after a sufficiently long time, everything evens out and we have an almost flat surface. If we open, the, in, in this case, the, the, the time it took to open the valve um, is about um, twice as long as the time it takes this water wave to travel through the basin once. Right? So they are comparable. There's just a factor of two between the two opening and closing time on the one hand and the, and the wave travel time on the other hand. So in, if we go to the slow filling mode, I guess you can already see what's going to happen now. The, um, the wave time is just a hundredth, one percent, uh, the, the, the wave time is a, hundred, uh, is a hundredth of the valve opening time. So I'm opening the, the valve very slowly so that the water can very rapidly uh, water waves can very rapidly oscillate in the basin. And what happens in that case is that the water level raises, rises, of course, very evenly. And I've, this is sort of a, a zoom in time, a Zeitrafferaufnahme in German, right? So the water level rises smoothly. Now you can, if, if you want to think about how to describe these two processes mathematically, this one is going to, much, to be much, much easier, obviously, than the other one. Here we just have to, to calculate how much water was going into the basin. How much area does the basin have? And that gives us immediately the depth of the water. Everybody can do that on the back of a beer deckel. Um, and in the, in the previous case, we have to actually take into account all these waves that are sloshing back and forth. And when you want to look at this in terms of mathematics, this is what comes out. Yeah, you don't have, I, I don't want to walk you through all the formulas, but really this formula here says the, this is the speed at which the water rises. And it is nothing but the, the stream of water that comes in per unit time divided by the area of the basin. That's all that, that happens. So the speed of lifting is equal to the volume that comes in divided by the area, end of story. So that's a, a very nice, simple model that's easy to understand and it's physically intuitive. And it essentially describes what happens when we are in this as we say, regime, when the valve opens very slowly relative to the travel time of the waves. This up here, of course, is more complicated, and if you want to describe that, you need to describe how the surface of the water moves and in, in a wave-like fashion, and you need to describe the depth of the water, which is called little h, and the velocity at which the water is moving at every point in space, x here, and in time. And that gives you a complicated equation system that combines one equation for the depth h and one equation for the velocity u of the fluid. And then this is called a partial differential equation, and it is just what mathematicians and climate modelers or fluid dynamicists would write down to describe these wave propagation processes. Now, mathematicians like to use this kind of ratio let me go back to slides here. The ratio of two timescales, for example, this is of order unity. It's just a factor of two in this case. But in this case, it was a factor of 100 between the two. And mathematicians like to use these limiting, uh, limiting arguments if, suppose, the wave time was really very, very small compared to the, uh, to the valve time. What would happen in that limiting case? and work that out as, as, as a limit process. And that exactly gives us, working from, from these complicated equations, it in fact allows us to derive this simplified little equation here by a mathematically systematic argument that uses this limit process of the two time scales being very, very much separated from each other. Now, this example is 
looks innocuous and little uh, oversimplified, but really this is something that's being used in the atmosphere in a slightly in, in atmospheric modeling in a slightly different fashion, but very related. And let me explain that to you next. What we have here is a view of uh, a weather map, as you would see it uh, similar to what you would see in, in the target show in the evening. Um, and um, we are interested in weather forecasting in how these low pressure and high pressure regions pass over, say, Berlin and uh, deliver their rainwater or whatever. Right? <clears throat> now, to describe this process, of course, we cannot just compute a two-dimensional weather map, like this, this map here, because the atmosphere is three-dimensional, right? It has an extension that goes from the bottom to up to 120 kilometers, where basically the density goes to very small values. So in the vertical, in fact, there is a pressure distribution. We all know that if we go from the sea level to Mount Everest, the pressure drops dramatically, right? There's very thin air up there, and that is a is the, the net effect of the pressure, the air pressure, dropping very dramatically when you go very high up a couple of tens of kilometers. Now, the atmosphere is compressible because uh, it is compressible and it carries sound waves. Otherwise, I could not speak to you, right? If it wasn't carrying sound waves, there would, no, would be no speech. These sound waves travel very quickly. They travel from the bottom to the top of the of, the, of uh, say, where uh, of, of what is called the troposphere, it's about 10 to 15 kilometers in height, travels in 30, 33 seconds, goes up 10 kilometers. Sound speeds are very fast. This is the, the fast wave process in the basin before, the analog of that. In this case, it's vertically traveling acoustic waves. The weather map time scale, we know it, right? When we look at the target show and we see how the prediction goes for the next 24 hours, the, 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 these weather patterns move about one diameter per day. So that's about once per day is the characteristic time scale of the weather map. So the ratio of the vertical sound time and the weather map time scale are 33 seconds divided by a day. And that's just four. 0.04%, very, very small number. So the mathematician says, aha, I can use the smallness of this ratio to simplify my equations. In a similar way, as I've argued before, I could e simplify the equation for the, for the sloshing water. And in fact, acoustic waves that would travel back and up and down and that would have to be described in detail by a complicated equation can get, el get eliminated to reduce an equation set. And that looks like this. This is, again, a complicated system of equations. I don't expect you to understand it. But just notice the, the red terms here, they are all associated with vertically ac traveling acoustic waves. And when we go to this limit, where the, where the sound waves travel fast, then one can cancel out these terms, as it turns out. And then the equation system is very much simplified. This is called the hydrostatic primitive equations. And it's called that because the approximation is that basically the pressure at any height equals the weight of the atmosphere above the point that we are looking at. That determines the pressure um, at every location. That's, this equation basically says that. Now, these are the equations that are you being used in climate models today. That's actually what's being used, this approximation. And now, here comes our colleague Edris Titi, who was with us for a half a year as a Humboldt uh, Prize winner at our department, and he proved rigorously, mathematically, that this set of equations, in fact, has good solutions, as mathematicians would say. Namely, um, if the, the data that on the atmosphere are smooth in the sense that we do not have jumps of pressure or jumps of velocity. The data are just smooth like the, the waves I showed you in the, in the sloshing basin. Um, then the solutions to these hydrostatic primitive equations are um, unique on the sphere when everything is periodic in both directions. And they depend continuously on the determining data. 
which is very important. Say, for example, we would make a small error in the height of the Alps in, in our bottom boundary description, right? A small error in the height of the Alps. Then the theorem states the error in the computation of the flow is equally small in terms of percentages, right? We make a 1% error in the, in the height of the Alps, then we can expect the error in the flow solution to be comparably small. That's the, a kind of robust robustness, so these equations are not sensitive to small errors. And that's a good result for, 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 uh, as a backup for what is being done in climate research. And this, in, this work came out in 2007, and you should note that before that time, it was not at all clear that that kind of statement would hold. In fact, it was shown that in certain situations, these equations do not have this nice behavior. When, for example, you try to just solve them on a limited domain just over Berlin, say. Now you have to go to the sphere, make it periodic in every direction, then you get these nice properties. If you try to cut the equations off at a finite domain size and just impose conditions in the, on the boundaries of Brandenburg, say, then that nice result doesn't hold. So in that sense, it is, as a mathematician, did not provide climate research results per se, but he backed up what climate research are, researchers are doing by mathematical arguments, giving more thrust to what the climate, compu climate computer models are, are being used for. So that's one of the contributions that mathematics, mathematicians can make to climate research, proving theorems about the model equations that the climate researchers use and helping them to find these equations by arguments, as I showed you, with these small numbers and ratios. So that was number one. Math helps reducing model complexity, so we get simpler equations, and these can be solved more efficiently on a computer. And then mathematics helps building trust in these models by proving theorems about them, hopefully the ones that show robustness and insensitivity. The second that I want to discuss is a complicated time series. Now we talk about data that we are faced with. And here I have taken an example. This is just a reminder. Um, if we talk about climate, we talk about statistics of weather. And when we have statistics, we have to have some data to do statistics with. right? And now let's look at an example that I took from Spishev. Spishek Kunchevich, a hydrologist at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. And um, that's about floods and droughts. And Spishek is studying these processes in the atmosphere as precipitation falls down. And then he is in, in particular interested in what happens afterwards with the rain. And where does it go? And does it swell the, the, the rivers? And do we get floods or do we not get floods? And one of the issues he was looking at was a paper by colleagues uh, Moodlesee and, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, co-workers who published in Nature um, 2003 a result, this is just the, the head, headline of the paper, no upward trends in the occurrence of extreme floods in Central Europe. Right? When we was, was discussing at the time the, the op the possibility that with changing climate, um, one would have more floods on average happening. That would, was one expectation one had. And then these people looked at the statistics and they didn't find any trends. They could not claim the data would predict more floods happening, even though that might seem to us sometimes when we are just in the middle of uh, uh, two floods happening yesterday and tomorrow, but statistically that was not significantly uh, showable. Now, he, Svishek looked at the data a little more closely, and then an interesting uh, point came about. Namely, he looked at the record levels of the Elbe at Dresden um, over the history back to the mid-ages, 1300 to 2000. And here are the very high floods. And you can see that distribution. It looks a little clumpy here, uh, more than it looked earlier. But really, this is not statistically significant as, as the 
um, as the honest statistician would say. So it looks like, well, there may be something, but we can't really judge. Then Spishek said, wait a second. Um, we can check when did these floods happen in the months. And when you look, you probably can't read it, but I have uh, put it here on the slide more explicitly. It turns out that in the mid-ages, in the warm time there, all the floods happened in the summer. Then there came an intermediate period where the floods happened in the winter time. And now we're back to getting the floods in the summer time again. That looks a lot more statistically significant than just the number counting game over the, uh, to try to get an average rate of, of, of floods. And in fact, what do these, these, these floods look like? They have de very different mechanisms, right? When you look at the Dresden flood uh, in 2002, this was just a lot of water coming down. And then um, the, the, uh, the pastures not being able to uh, absorb it anymore, and then the river, the uh, the Elbe River went over the dikes. The winter floods have a very different mechanism. In the winter, it happens. This is a picture from the Niagara Falls in 1980, 1938, uh, near the Honeymoon Bridge, where you can see a lot of ice piling up in that river. And this, in fact, was the reason for the flooding. It's, it's often the reason for winter floods, that the ice breaks, it piles up, and then it clogs the river, and then the water that comes, back, uh, uh, comes after goes, goes over the dikes. So the mechanisms are very, very different. Now, these kinds of more sophisticated statistical analyses are, in this case, born from the ingenuity of Spishek Kuncevich. Now, mathematics can provide mechanisms that take data and extract features from them without you having to have all the insight that Spishek has into hydrology. Right? So there is, there is systematic procedures to, look, to, to have computers scan data and extract properties that are characteristic for that particular data set. And I would like to discuss a little more uh, of that right here. The observations of like the floods or precipitation events or what have you, they're often sparse. That means, um, as in our flood case, there are, isn't su such a dense data set. You just have a few of them. That can happen. They are often non-contiguous. It can happen, for example, that there is a weather station in Potsdam on one hill, and that is taken away and placed to a different hill, let's say in 1950. Then the data set that was taken from 1900 to 1950 gets interrupted and slightly modulated and changed by the new data coming up from the other position. And since each of the positions on different mountains or hills has, has different air flows around them, that can make a difference in terms of the statistics. And if you were to treat these, um, these two data sets equally and treat them as one contiguous sequence of data, you would make a statistical error, significant statistical error. It can be more subtle. You have the same station at the same place, and they just exchange the technique to observe, to observe the weather. Right? The measurement station is switched from a, from a physical device to an electronic device. Even that can make a difference. So these data sets are not always contiguous in time. Then they can be very high dimensional. We will get an ex example of that. And then they can involve hidden trends and regime changes. And we had an example of that with the floods, right? We had a regime where always we had the floods in the summer to a regime where we had it in the winter and back now to the summer regime, which indicates we are getting warm again like we had it in the Middle Ages. And then there is another issue, which is an, called the attribution problem in, in climate. What you would like to know is, or have, you would like to have mechanisms that say, suppose I have a data set and that gives me certain features that I can extract by mathematical techniques. But I also know that, for example, there is an Nino going on every seven years, coming back and uh, 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 going and coming back. Then the question is, can we, from the data, extract information about whether or not 
El Nino has anything to do with the, with the phenomenon that we extract from the data. That's the attribution problem. And all of these questions can be merged into a statistical, uh, in, into data analysis tools um, that have quite a, a sophisticated mathematical foundation. Here is an example of an Indian summer, which is called a jet blocking state. And um, intuitively, when you have these, these um, beautiful weather situations in the fall, they over maybe a week or even three weeks, they come about in the following way. You have the, around the Earth, you have wind jet streams that normally meander around and basically are continuously flowing and jiggling a little. But these can fold over, these streams can fold over and form what is called an omega shape. And you can think of it as two Three vortices, one turning this way, another turning also this way, and another, um, this vortex, oh, wait a second, this, this one turns this way, that also turns this way, and the, the other one turns the other, in the other direction. Okay, so the upper one turns this way, and the two lower ones turn this way, which means when the jet stream comes from here, it has to overcome the induced velocity that the vortices want to push against the jet stream. And that makes the jet go around the omega. And it so happens that these triple vortex, vortex arrangements, they can be very stable, and they can stabilize each other, and then they sit there for quite a while. And that gives us, for example, the Scandinavia high that we all know from winter times. That's when the Siberian air comes by Berlin, and it's bitter cold and very crisp and beautiful blue skies. Right. Uh, we had that last winter, if you remember. Right. And um, now, um, the uh, European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast, ECMWF, um, s systematically collects data series over the history of weather prediction. Um, uh, uh, history of weather prediction. And basically collects the statistics of, of weather over horizons of uh, now it's 60 years or something <clears throat> that they have. And it's called reanalysis because what they do is they take observation data, uh, but these are always sparse in, in space, right? We have not everywhere we have an, an observation station. So the data in between the stations are filled in by model computations, like weather forecast model computations. But those are tuned to run optimally along the observed data, and that is interpreted as the representative weather history that we have had. And so in these ECMWF um, reanalysis data, hidden in there are, of course, over 40 years, a lot of Indian summer situations, blocking, jet blocking situations. And now, with a data analysis technique that our colleague Ilya Horenko developed, who was here with us up until a few years ago. He is now in, in Lugano in Switzerland as a professor. He took these data and asked the question, can I attribute to, uh, the, uh, um, can I attribute to the occurrence of Indian summer situations effects that have to do with the seasonal cycle, winter, summer, fall, and uh, um, um, and spring, or with the CO2 change in the atmosphere, or with the activity of sunspots. Right? Can, can I find in the data a correlation between these events? So what he did is he uh, looked at the CO2 data in the atmosphere. This is a representative of uh, on Mauna Loa in, on Hawaii, where the Scripps Institution takes um, has been taking for decades a continuous record of the CO2 content of the atmosphere. And you can see here that in the meantime, from 1962 to today, it has risen by something like uh, 30%. Right? There's no doubt about it. The CO2 content of the atmosphere goes up. That's one of the external ingredients that Ilya took into account and tried to match with uh, the, the, the data for the blocking situation. And then here is a uh, sunspot activity uh, history uh, as a plot of the intensity versus time. As you can see, these are 
what is it? Um, something like 10 to 12 year cycles uh, where the sunspot activity goes up and down. And so what he did was lots of mathematics. I don't walk you through this. I just want to show you that there are some formulas behind it and even more formulas. <clears throat> and when he's done, he gets results that look like this. He has four panels here, which show the typical pattern he identified as the Scandinavia high, the equivalent of the Scandinavia high in the, in the data. And the upper left panel is in 1959, so he has a two co CO2 content of the atmosphere equivalent to 1959. And it's the winter situation where the, the Scandinavia high is pretty big. Right? And that's the situation with the Siberian air, air coming, coming from the east. Now we go from two, uh, 1959 to 2003 and stay in winter. And we see that the, the, um, the um, change in CO2 equivalent um, during 40 years has basically diminished the intensity of these, of these weather patterns statistically. So there is a reduction due to the warming or due to the CO2 content or correlated, I should better say, correlated to the CO2 content, which is an indication that there might be a, a, a logical causal co um, uh, relation between um, the CO2 increase and the change of this pattern. When we now go from winter to summer, we have the seasonal effect coming in and um, that's obvious that there is that in summer these patterns are much smaller than they are in winter or less intense and uh, the the trend that in the later times with more co2 it's even less intense than at earlier times that trend holds for both the summer and the winter time right and so now uh, he has effects he can attribute or we can see correlations of the change of this typical pattern with the season and with the CO2 content of air, but he didn't find any correlation of this pattern with the sunspot activity. That was just not in the data. It didn't come out. Right? And these, these methods are gauged to allow you to make statements about where are strong connections and where are not in such data. So that was the second topic, and the third one will be very short. But let me finish this. So mathematics can help characterizing complex data by extracting typical features that are in there, interesting features. And then um, relate these, uh, the occurrence of these patterns and features to external influences that might or might not cause them. And in that sense, give us a neutral, not prejudiced by physical arguments, a neutral, just data dependent statement about is there the possibility of a connection or is there not. <clears throat> All right, now let's get to the last to point. That's us more, I want to tell you more of a story than giving you a lot of details here. And the story goes like this. In climate research, in climate impact research rather, the notion of vulnerability plays a big role. It is an important question to ask, is a state, the state of Bangladesh, say, vulnerable to climate change because, say, sea level rise, and then Bangladesh is very low level, like Netherlands, and there's a, a strong uh, possibility that Bangladesh would get a lot of floods under climate change. So that kind of question is behind that notion of vulnerability. And vulnerability occurs when you go through Google or wherever, uh, your, your own sources of information, you find that notion in many fields, in biology, in economy and finance, in uh, development studies, uh, in, in, in sociology, in climate change research, as I said, etc. And then there is a, an author, Tyveson, who lists 35 different definitions of vulnerability. Now, there was a, a project at the Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research, where I was working many years ago, where the challenge was to produce a map of vulnerability for Europe, vulnerability to climate change. So the, 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 the challenge was bring up a, a, a number, 
that measures the vulnerability to climate change of the countries in Europe. And it turned out that the scientists in that group, it was an, a European international consortium, they were discussing what is vulnerability for two years, and nothing happened. And it's clear, there's 35 different defer definitions of vulnerability, and before you can actually take down a number and say, this is the vulnerability of Netherlands to climate change, you have to know what you measure, and you have to define it and nail it down. You can't just go and measure something, right? And so this was a real problem, it, and it, it turns out a problem of language. It was unclear. The, the, the notions behind this vulnerability thing were un, so unclear, they couldn't measure it. So what happened? Here's an, here's an example for the, the confusion that, ha, that, that we had. These sentences you would typically find in, in some of the documents that deal with vulnerability. Some rural district, countryside district of country X, is vulnerable to poverty. So this, is, this X country here is vulnerable to the property of being poor. You could also see the notion of vulnerability coming up when you say some coastal district of country Y is vulnerable to hurricanes. That's a very different thing, right? Here we talk about the property of country X, and here we talk about something that hits country X. This cannot be the same vulnerability, right? It's something different. And then the government found itself in a vulnerable state. So this, again, is the entire supposition, state, whatever, of, a, of, of that country, and it is a vulnerable state. So three different ways, completely different ways, of using the same word vulnerable. And it is clear that it's not easy to write down a measurable number for this beast. So what happened in, in, at the Potsdam Institute, we had one person working in the social systems department who was in that project, and one person working in the mathematics branch of the, of the Potsdam Institute, and they both loved soccer, fußball. They always met over a beer in, in, the, uh, in one of, of the bars in Potsdam, and they watched soccer games and talked. And so they started talking about their research. And then... The mathematician asked the, uh, the sociolo sociologist, what are you doing? And he talked about vulnerability. Can you explain it to me? And then they started discussing this and getting it down to mathematical precision. So what the two worked out together was basically the following. They said, let's have a close look at the relevant definition of vulnerability that this intergovernmental panel of, for climate change is proposing. Let's make that the basis of our discussion. So that says vulnerability is the degree to which a system is susceptible to and unable to cope with adverse effects of climate change, including etc., etc. Let's just focus on this first part. The second part is, is, is something different. Now, when you look at this closely, you see, the degree to which there has to be some measurable quantity there. You have to find a quantity that can be measured. Then a system in mathematics um, is a very specific thing. A system has a state and it evolves in time and there is rules of how it evolves in time. This is the, the, the world of dynamical systems. That's the, the slang word for it, in, in the math slang word for it. Right? And so there is a framework within which, in mathematics, within which you can describe systems that have a state and that evolve forward in time under certain rules. And this, this you should invoke when you define vulnerability. Susceptible to, or and unable to cope with, implies future. Right? When you think about it, um, the hurricane, uh, the, or the, um, uh, yeah, the, the hurricane hit uh, the coast of Florida all the time, and then um, a single hurricane isn't going to damage Florida for good. But if in, a, in, in the future we will have an increase of hurricane frequencies and intensities, then Florida might not be able to cope with it anymore. So in that notion of susceptible to and to cope with is an effect of future. So that again points to the systems and entity thing that you want to look at 
a an entity that has a state and evolves forward in time and you want to measure its damages under certain external effects right and then here come the adverse effects of climate change and there is adverse in there that's again that's an order structure you have to know what's better and what's worse right that's another mathematical beast an order structure kleiner gleich und größer gleich um, and then adverse effects of climate change means there is some change, some external impact that has an effect on that system. And these external effects you have to take into account. So the framework is look at dynamical systems that are driven from with external forces. Invent an, a measure for a scalar measure for their, their well-being derived from that state of the system. And then Look whether that state goes up or down in that measure. That's the very simplest version of, of, the, of the framework that they built. And they made it a quite more sophisticated machinery that uh, was able to cope with um, many of the questions that came up in that project on vulnerability at the time. So, yeah, just one remark. The guy who did that, Cesar Unescu, built that mathematical framework in a programming language, which is in fact equivalent to mathematics, it's called Haskell. So that the definitions he wrote down in mathematical terms could be implemented directly on a computer and used as code in the project, which was a quite a, an interesting feat of combining mathematics and informatics to immediately produce a result that you can use computationally. Right? Okay, anyway, that's a side remark, and here we go. Mathematics can help narrowing down ambiguities in natural language concepts and then structuring complex discussions in that way, making things more precise. So that was the three things I wanted to tell you. Uh, climate models, computer models are important. Mathematics can help simplifying life for these modelers and uh, show that the simplified life is actually worthwhile living. Um, mathematics can help make sense of complex data. And mathematics as a structural science can help clean up discussions. Thank you very much.